God, you are holy. For who could stand near you? Who could come beside you? God, there is no one. There is nothing. There is no other God. You are the one true God. That we have an opportunity to come and worship and to bless your name and to serve you and to exalt you the God of the universe. Oh, we are so thankful that you are holy and yet you still pursue us. You still show us your great love and mercy and grace. You still call us to be your own. You still call us to draw near you, Lord. Oh, we are thankful, God. You are great. You are amazing. And we lift up our praises here and in our homes to you, God. We declare the praises to you. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, isn't it awesome? You may have a seat. It's so awesome to be here you know, worshiping the Lord. That, thank you to, to our worship team. That was just awesome time of worship. And to, yeah, I'm, I mean, I get goosebumps. I do. It's, it's great to come into the house of the Lord and to praise Him and also in our homes to just praise Him. I mean, it is a joy to be unified in this way, and so I'm thankful to be with you this morning. My name is Danny. I serve as one of the pastors here. If this is your first time, we are glad that you are here with us, whether you're here or checking us out online for the first time. In the midst of a pandemic, right? It's such an excuse to just say, I'm staying home. No, no, but people are still coming, and we're thankful that you are here worship, worshiping with us this Sunday morning. If you would do us a favor, if you're here in this auditorium, there is a response card. If you could fill that out, that's in the back on the way out, just letting us know that you are here. It's a good way for us to get connected with you. If you're online, if you click at the bottom link below, same information, go ahead and fill that out. Um, that gives us a way to, again, connect with you. Even if you're at home online, we still have a way to connect with you. The response card and also our family groups cards are back there. Um, listen, let me say this. this. Even in the midst of a pandemic, we're still called to be together. We're still called to be a family and to meet with one another, no matter where we're at. And our, our family groups are meeting primarily online and, and it's awesome because we still got people joining. Uh, this week in our family group, we had someone join for the very first time. And that was exciting, you know, in, the, in Zoom, right? Yeah. And so if you're here, you're, you're kind of on the fence. Uh, maybe I'll just wait until the pandemic is over. Well, we don't know when it's going to finish, right? It could be here another year or two. I'm praying that that's not the case at all. But nonetheless, we're still called to join together. So I'll, I'm going to challenge you. If you're here on the fence and you've been thinking about being a part of a family group, sign up. You can use that card in the back. Use the link online and get connected to one of our family groups. It's a great way to not only join with others, but also spend time in God's Word as a family. So it's awesome to do that. Also, also one of the things that we are really, really passionate about here at our church is orphan care ministry. Um, and you've known, for a lot of you, know that we do have an orphan care ministry here. There's a great need within our city, right? There are a lot of children who need homes, who need food, who need protection, who need clothing. And so we have an orphan care ministry here, and our orphan care ministry just established a pretty cool partnership that, listen, it wouldn't do any justice if I sit here and talk to you about it, right? I've got some pretty cool friends that are going to share a message with us on the screen. So check this two-minute video out, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about it after the video. Hi, my name is Stella. And I'm Esther. We have been a foster family for over six years. Did you know that when kids are placed in homes, they often arrive with only the clothes they're wearing? It's often up to the foster parents to give them what they need once they arrive. It's been a goal of our church to have a resource closet for foster families and adoptive families to come and find what they need. Instead of making our own closet, we are excited to partner with Homestead Christian School because they already have their own closet. The school is already receiving clothing donations, but now they have space for larger items such as cribs, car seats, and baby gear. In addition to the resource closet, the school also has a crib room CRIB stands for Children's Reception Intake Base. 
Kids are often removed in the middle of the night where they either go to an office building or an all-night McDonald's while they wait for their caseworker to make phone call after phone call to find them a home. Instead of going to an office or an all-night McDonald's, the kids can go to the crib room where they can be fed, washed, and taken care of while their case manager sorts out all the details. The school has a heart to send kids out of the crib room with a duffel bag of new supplies. Some of the supplies may include shoes, clothes, blankets, and anything they need to feel comfortable at their new home. So, what does this mean for us? We as a church and community now have a few ways to get involved. First, you can donate new or lightly used items to the resource closet. This includes children's clothing, cribs, car seats, or shoes. Second, you can purchase items on a wish list to help fill a duffel bag that will be given to a kid coming through the crib room. You can find that wish list right here in this link and in the description below. Third, you can volunteer your time at the closet to help organize donations and keep it running smoothly. We are really excited about this partnership with Homestead Christian Academy and we hope you are too. If you'd like more information on this video, you can reply to us in the comments, email us at orphancare at rchomestead.org or you could talk to us directly. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye. Just to kind of start their journey. I mean, I know it's, it's tragic for a child, but any way that we can possibly help and care for this child as they're being removed from a home, I mean, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful step. And so what we're asking, and this is what the video was going to say, uh, what, what we're asking, if you are, you are here, you want to be involved with this project, with this partnership. And there's a few ways that you can be involved. You can, you, you can donate um, any type of clothes that you have, any goods that you may have. Um, again, it's a beautiful closet with a bunch of clothes that they have. So anything that you can donate. You can also volunteer time as well. There is a need for um, those to kind of volunteer their time there. Um, and, and also our meals team. This is kind of a separate from that partnership. But we have, you know, it's one orphan care ministry. But we have a great need for, for folks to, to kind of help out providing meals. So that when a family takes on a new child, that they are provided with meals um, and that can help this family out as well as the child. So if you're here, you're saying, how can I be involved? How can I get involved? Go to our, our website, send an email to orphancare at rchomestead.org. Okay, so if you go ahead and provide that, and um, that would be good. I'm getting a cue back there. I don't know what. I'm... Okay, so that, can, that could be a great help because there is a need. We're, we're here and, and God has called us all. Listen, let me say this. And I know I'm about to get preachy here. But, let, but let, let's, be, let's keep it real. There, we are all called to care for the orphans in our city. In one way, shape, or form. James 1 talks about pure religion, right? Taking care of the widows and orphans. That's a call for us to be involved. And so, whether you cannot foster, right? So some folks say, I can't, I can't foster that's fine. There's other ways that you can be involved. Can you imagine, again, a child coming for the first time doesn't know. No, we have to meet that child where they're at, and there's many different ways. And so I'm asking you to pray. Where is the Lord leading you to kind of help, to help the children within our city? And, and may God kind of lead you in that um, as, you, as you think through it. So, again, send an email to orphancarechomestead.org. And another thing that we are... So, completely passionate about is is helping churches within our city get started and the way we do that um we do that through prayer we th do that through training and equipping coaching uh giving money and also being a friend and we have a friend today carlos lolette that is going to be bringing the word today come on up here carlos Carlos is going to be starting a church in South Miami called Reality Church. It's that reality, right? Reality. We're keeping it reality. Um, and so we're, we're thankful that he's here to, to preach the word. Um, but also just understand, when you give, when you give, it's to help start churches, right, in our partnerships that we have. Because we understand it's not about just restoration. We need more churches within this city. 
so that the gospel may continue to be proclaimed and people may continue to hear the good news. And so I'm thankful for faithful men like Carlos to step up and say, yeah, I'm about it. I'm ready to start a church here within this city and, and have others follow so that we can continue to proclaim that gospel. So I'm thankful for him and his partnership. And uh, so what I want to do is pray for him and we will get going. Join me in prayer. God, we're thankful, Father. Thankful. It is, it's awesome to have faithful men of God come up and say, I want to I serve you. I want to be led by you. And I want to care for this city, a, a city that Carlos loves. And so we're thankful for this man of God um, ready to uh, start a church, reality church in South Miami. God, I pray that you would bless him, Lord, bless the ministry, that it would grow, Lord, that hearts and lives may come to know who you are, Jesus. That's the work that you've called us to, Lord. And so I'm thankful for him, Lord, in that way. May you give him uh, the strength and the endurance for the weeks and months ahead. Amen. And may you speak to, to him today as he gives us the word, Lord. We're thankful for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's great to see you um, this morning. I'm so grateful for you, and I'm so grateful for your pastor, Steve, who uh, I know had surgery this past week, and so we've been uh, praying for him. And Steve, man, I know you're watching online. I love you, bro. I'm so grateful for you, and just grateful to be here with you. Also, a quick shout out, of course, to those people in reality who are watching online, the reality fam. So um, I... I I don't, there are really no words uh, that can describe the feeling of appreciation that I have for you. I think I mentioned this a couple of months ago when I was here. This church really is a safe haven, not only for people in this community, but even for local pastors. Uh, and your pastor, Steve, is also one of my pastors, and I'm really grateful for him. Encourage him, love him, pray for him because uh, he's a great man of God, and I love his family as well. So um, I want to I wanna invite you to go ahead and turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to read uh, starting in verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to read um, in verse 8 through 17. How about now? A uh, quick side note, um, if you guys, my girls worked really hard on that video, so I would love for you to log on to our Facebook page and watch it. <laughs> Please, uh, they would appreciate it. So online, find my girls. Okay, First uh, Peter 3, chapter 8. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. One of my great joys in life, one of my predilections, is sometimes finding a great meme. You know what I'm talking about? or laughing at, uh, at a hysterical gif, or sometimes reflecting on a particular quote. 
And I came across a quote this week that I wanted to share with you. It's by church historian Justo Gonzalez. And I want you to see what he writes. He says this. The church must be one because a fragmented church is not much help to a fragmented world. The church must be one because a fragmented church is not much help to a fragmented world. If you've never been to church, and you're curious about Christianity, and you find yourself either in this place or online, I want you to know that as you read the pages of the New Testament, and you see the vision of what Jesus has in mind when he calls, uh, when he puts a group of people together to constitute a church, part of that vision is to see a kind of society that displays great unity in the midst of division. Um, there is a marvelous sort of splendor and beauty um, that we live around in the world, especially here in South Florida. We can enjoy right, the a magnificent sunset with all of those different colors in the Miami sky. We can enjoy a day in the pool or the ocean. We can enjoy the pleasure of living in a diverse city and tasting all sorts of different kinds of cuisine. There is great beauty in the world, and yet Christians sometimes use the word broken. There is a brokenness in the world in the midst of that beauty because we have empirically seen that even though there are beautiful things to behold in the world, that there's something in the human heart that sometimes longs for an insatiable amount of power, that there's something in the human heart that causes us to hurt other people, that causes us to oppress those that may be different from us in order that we may gain comfort. There is a fragmentation in the world. And when you read the Bible, here's what you discover. You discover that God has a plan to fix that fragmentation. And part of the plan is a church, a group of people who are indeed fragmented and broken and yet have experienced the healing and transforming power of Jesus Christ. It's so wild. It's like, okay, God's going to use these people in order to bring healing and transformation to a world that is fragmented. But how can we do that if the church itself is fragmented? We already face a lot of different challenges. We face the challenge as the church where sometimes the culture that we live in could care less about what we would say. Sometimes we face the challenge that our culture can stand diametrically opposed and sometimes even against what the church preaches. And sometimes, of course, the church looks just as fragmented as, as the world and the culture around it. So one question that comes out of this text that we just read this morning is this. Listen, how do we live in the midst of such a fragmented World, How are we supposed to, as the church, as the bride of Jesus Christ, live in such a divisive time in our culture? Think about it. Man, we're living in a period of social and racial unrest. We are in an election year and living in one of the most politically charged times in recent history. And yeah, by the way, there's a global pandemic. What are we supposed to do? How should we live as the church in this fragmented world. The good news is, listen, this is the perfect time for you and for me, for the church to move forward in faith and not stand back in fear. How do we live in the midst of this fragmented world? Listen 
to what the text says. I'm gonna, you can write this down as number one. Number one, we ought to model a distinct collective witness. How do we live in the midst of such fragmented world? We should model, watch this, a distinct collective witness. Here's what Peter writes. He says, finally, all of you, all of you, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Did you hear what Peter writes? He says, all of you, all of you. Sometimes in the West, right, in this side of the globe, we tend to read the Bible individualistically. We tend to sometimes read the Bible and and. And we kind of forget the pronouns, you know, and we just kind of think, oh, man, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to um, have sympathy and brotherly love and a tender heart and a humble mind. And of course, yeah, you're supposed to have all of those things. But I don't want you to miss that Peter right here is talking to a group of people. It's a collective group of people. And, and he's saying, listen, you need to have a distinct collective witness, a DCW, right? Distinct collective witness. Witness, because the church is supposed to be a group of people who form this alternate society. They don't have to face, ideally and scripturally, we don't have to face the same challenges and insults that we face from those who stand outside or opposed to the church. Right? Peter is calling us in a way to put our love on display. And did you hear the qualities he used? He said, listen, y'all, right, you all, all of you, I want you to be, I want you to have unity, unity of mind, like-mindedness. In the New Testament church, and certainly here in Miami, uh, we're supposed to have people from like all different kinds of cultures, right, and, and, and different backgrounds, dim, and those people bring different perspectives and cultural preferences, and those preferences, they create tension, don't they? Those preferences create tension in our midst. And, and here's what Peter's saying. Listen, in the midst of all of that diversity, we need to be like-minded. We need to have unity. Because unity, you've heard this before perhaps, unity does not mean uniformity. I heard a pastor say that a place where everyone thinks alike on every issue is described as a cult. <laughs> That's a cult. And we're not supposed to be a cult. We're supposed to be the church. Theologian Shiashi Ashiwe, she writes this. The, by the way, I practiced that for a while, by the way. You know what I'm saying? That came out smooth, and, and it wasn't earlier. <laughs> Praise God. No, she writes this. The essence of the church, watch this, is the community in union with Christ in the midst of conflict. Like mindedness, unity of mind. And he says sympathy or understanding. It means that, you know, sympathy means that we get to share our feelings with somebody else, that we can put ourselves in somebody else's shoes. So, so he has this vision of the church. He's, he's encouraging all of us. He says, listen, the church uh, should be a place where brothers and sisters understand where they're coming from and what they're feeling, right? Sympathy is taking one step to be able to develop a safe space where people can have conversation, where people can bring their feelings with honesty rather than process that just at home by themselves or worse yet, uh, letting uh, different kinds of media outlets on the left and the right process their emotions. The church should be a place of understanding and sympathy. He says also it should be a place of brotherly love. This is what you should have. This is a quality. And it's so interesting that he uses a term of family. Like there's a family obligation here. It's almost like Peter saying this. Hey, guys, here are the family rules. The family rules are, guess what? We're going to be like-minded. I know we're all different. Okay? I know we have different things that we, perspectives and, and different preferences, but we're going to be united. Number two, um, we're going to have sympathy for each other. We're going to listen. Right? Number three. We're going to show brotherly 
love in this household. And I love it because it's the kind of passage that helps us to see that love is not just this feeling. It's not just affection, but it's a commitment. It's a commitment to love somebody else, to do right by them because they are your family. They're your family. The picture that Peter has in in the pages of the New Testament in this writing is not us loving people with with clenched uh, teeth, like, (laughs) okay, you go ahead and do that. All right, sometimes when our girls, you know, I have two girls, they're six and five, Maya and Kara, you know, and they're incredible. And babies, I love you if you're watching. So here's what happens. Sometimes they get together and they play. And sometimes when you play, you fight. Uh, and then let's say they're both sitting on timeout. And I'm like, okay, you know what? You got to tell your sister that you forgive her. And one of them will be like, okay, I forgive you. Well, that's not the kind of brotherly or sisterly love that Peter has in mind. What he has in mind is this. Listen, the power of God, the Spirit, has changed you radically to a point that you are able to be free to love people like your brother and your sister. He also says this, compassion. You ought to have compassion or tender heartedness. And I love this because the root word for um, this particular uh, compassionate word in, in the Greek is the word splagma. Splagma. It's an onomatopoeia. Right? In other words, it's, uh, it's the kind of word that you listen to, and it has an effect. You know what I'm talking about? It's like the word slap or the word stomp. You can say splagma, right? Splagma. You got to have splagma. All right? When people are coming around and they have differences of opinion or somebody is hurting, instead of getting your PhD in statistics, guess what? You got to have splagma. Instead of throwing around all these different stats, splagma, you know? It's a word, literally, that in, in, that, in, in the language of, of Greek, it can refer to your intestines, like it's something coming out from within you, that the church should be a compassionate place. And then finally, he says, it should be a place that you should have humility. Humility. This is like the cardinal Christian virtue. You know, it's interesting that humility was not valued in the Greco-Roman world. They did not value humility. They valued glory. But what does humility do? Like we read in Philippians chapter 2, you know, when we pursue humility, we consider others as more important than ourselves. We don't, humility doesn't pursue status. We're not thirsty to become influencers in the church or outside of it. You know what humble people do really well? They listen. They listen really well. You know what prideful people do? They talk a lot. They share their opinions without listening. Where are you today? Are you a person that listens well? You see, Christians... We have been called to model a distinct collective witness that is grounded in our identity as Christians. It was Jesus, listen, who modeled humility for us. We call him our older brother because of the work that he's done on the cross for us. Because he came down and sacrificially he saw that we needed saving from our sin. And so he showed us compassion. Our king, he embodies the values that we seek to embrace. And so how do we apply this in our lives? In the midst of such a fragmented world, I want to remind you that wherever you stand on different cultural issues, before you are a Democrat or a Republican, you are a citizen of the kingdom. You are distinct You model a distinct collective witness because guess what? The values of Christianity are never going to align perfectly with any American political party because you can have, listen, you can have differences of beliefs. You can stand up for the sanctity of life and for racial injustices while loving the police. 
right? You can do all of those things, but I, I want to challenge you to refuse, listen, to refuse letting the culture dictate where you stand and letting your king define that for you. We got to model a distinct collective witness. How do we live in this fractured world? Number one, we model that distinct witness. Number two, we retaliate with blessing. Retaliate with blessing. Here's what Peter writes. He says, don't repay evil for evil, reviling for reviling. It's like insults for insults. But on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. And then he quotes Psalm 34. He says this. This is why in your Bibles, it might look like a little poem, by the way. It's a quotation from the book of Psalms. For whoever desires to love life and see the good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And if you know anything about the scriptures, you know what I sometimes find ironic? That it's Peter who is writing these words. See, Peter, um, (laughs) Peter's like the disciple who is like the Enneagram 8 of the New Testament. Okay, he he he's the one that puts his foot in his mouth. Sometimes he's passionate. He is aggressive. Um, He is the one that messes up hanging out with, uh, you know, in the book of Galatians, he's hanging out with Gentiles instead of like being united with Gentiles and Jews. He's the one that retaliates by taking out his sword and cutting off the ear of the Roman soldier that's trying to get Jesus. He's the one that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's the one writing these words. It's so interesting. This is a man who has been transformed by Jesus and by his spirit. And, 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 and he reminds us of the words of Jesus. It harkens us back to the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said this. Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies and bless those who persecute. This um, quotation from Psalm 34, it was written during a time when King David was under a lot of distress, okay? And I want you to think about this for me. I I want you to place yourself in the shoes of the people that, that Peter's speaking to because they would know that he was quoting Psalm 34. It's, it's reminding them of this story. Um, David is under this great period of duress. And and if you just look back in your Bibles to Psalm 34, you're going to see that there's a little heading there. And it says, of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, so that he drove him out and he went away. This is what that period is describing. It's describing a time when, when David was promised and anointed as the king, but he wasn't the king yet. There was Saul, who was a frenemy, right? He was really an enemy who was uh, essentially persecuting David. He was after his life. And David, he begins to write the psalm. And, and you know what the first line of the psalm is? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. It's, it, it's, it's incredible how David did not let his persecution distract him from praising God to blessing him. And Peter's audience would have known who he was talking about. They would have known that David was promised a kingdom, but the kingdom was not yet here. He had to live in that already. Yeah, this is yours, but not yet. Okay, then all of a sudden in Peter's audience, it's like this. Listen, you're living in exile, but you have already tasted the kingdom and his glory. The kingdom has already come, but but not yet in full. Right. 
And then even to us, as we read this text, he's reminding us that, guess what? If you're a Christian, you have tasted the fruit of the kingdom of God when Jesus Christ saved you. And I want you to live this way. I want you to retaliate with blessing because, guess what? The kingdom in full is coming. That's coming. That is a promise, listen, to you so that when somebody insults you, for your Christian behavior, or somebody shames you uh, for having certain Christian uh, convictions, Peter says, listen, I want you to bless them. I want you to bless those people. I don't want you to respond with insult and insult. I want you to let the Spirit of God be able to stop that cycle of foolishness so that you can change the narrative. What does that look like? Um, Karen Jobes, uh, she tells the story of a Christian soldier who, um, who was living in the barracks uh, of his unit. And each evening, here's what he would do. He would read his Bible and he would pray. And each night before going to bed, there was a soldier across the aisle that would insult him, that would mock him for being a Christian. In fact, one night, that soldier across the aisle he threw his muddy boots, and they went flying all the way into the bed of this other soldier. The next morning, the soldier across the aisle, he uh, found his, his, his boots at the foot of his bed, cleaned and polished and ready for inspection. And several soldiers in that unit came to know the Lord because of this inner strength and witness that the soldier had displayed. That's what it looks like to return a blessing for an insult. So what does it look like practically in your life? Uh, Listen, um, I'll give you three thoughts. You can encourage somebody. Right? If you're being insulted for what you believe or for your convictions or being mocked, even by family members or those um, who may not care a lot about Christianity, you can encourage them. Maybe you can say, you know what? You're made in the image of God, and I don't appreciate what you're saying, but God loves you anyways, and he's got a plan for your life. Right? You can encourage people. You can affirm what is true. Right? Encouraging and retaliating with blessing doesn't mean lying. <laughs> okay? It doesn't mean hiding what's true. But you can find something to encourage somebody with, or you can pray for them. You can ask God to bless them, to show His favor on their life. You can serve them practically. But what we do know is this, listen, how do we live in the midst of such a fragmented world? We show a collective witness that is distinct. Number two, we retaliate with blessing. And then number three, we fear God and live courageously. Fear God and live courageously courageously. Look at what the text says. Now, who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? You may say, a lot of people, Peter, okay? (laughs) But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that, not if, but when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Sometimes the gap between our obedience and disobedience is fear. Sometimes the gap between doing what God has called us to do and not doing it is fear. It could be a fear of man, fear of a person. It could be the fear, in this particular case, of suffering. Of course, God has given us not a spirit of fear, but of a sound mind, right? He 
gave us his power so that we can live courageously in the midst of a fragmented world. Because listen, right now the world, the world needs leaders. The world needs us to be able to step up and be fearless and live courageously. One question, when I'm struggling with fear and when I'm making a decision, one question that I ask myself that has been helpful, that leads us back to this text, is the question of, does this honor God or not? Is the way that I'm living, is the way that I'm responding, honor Christ? Does my silence honor God or does it offend Him? The text says that don't fear, but in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord, as holy, right? Holy meaning, man, He, he is set apart. He is, he is our creator and our father, yet He is so different than us. Like He is glorious. Like we can't stand in His presence because of our sinfulness. But thank God that Jesus came so that we can approach our, our heavenly Father honor this holy God. Like honor, when you think about that, when you're making a decision, right? When, when you're, when you, especially in a time of fragmentation and division, when you stand before the Lord and you put that picture in your mind and you remember his holiness and how glorious he is and suddenly fear starts to dissipate. All of a sudden, those fears that you had of other people or of suffering, they, they, they're put to rest because you know that God is in charge. That if you should be afraid of anybody, it should be God and not somebody else. Listen, how do we stand in the midst of such a fragmented world? We fear God. And we live courageously. We live boldly. Because listen, in the midst of crisis, in the midst of this time, you're going to be tempted to do stupid things. I'm going to be tempted to do stupid things, to speak out of turn, or to do something dumb in your relationships. You're going to be tempted to take advantage of other people financially because you're trying to survive. Some of you may be tempted to tell yourself, you know what, look at this pandemic. Where is God in all of this? <laughs> Thankfully, Christianity is not two years old. Thankfully, Christianity has been around for thousands of years. And this is not the first time that we have faced a global Pandemic. In fact, one of the ways Christianity grew in different periods of history was because there were men and women who lived courageous lives, who stood up in the midst of crisis and said, you know what, I'm going to serve those who are in need. It's because they feared God and they lived courageous lives. Listen, Peter is challenging us here. And he's reminding us that, of course, there is suffering in the Christian life. If we learn anything in First Peter's, we learn that the Christian life, you're going to have suffering. Suffering that may be unprovoked, that we can't even explain, kind of like Job. It could be a suffering that's brought on by others, or it can be a suffering brought on by your own evil actions. And while we may not understand all that happens in the realm of suffering, what we do know is that in the New Testament, the writers and Jesus consider suffering to be a privilege and a blessing because it is a sign of God's favor. It's a sign that it validates your Christian faith. That's why Paul says in Philippians 3 that he wants to share in the fellowship of Jesus' sufferings and the power of his resurrection. It's mind-blowing. Christianity is different. It is distinct. And it calls us to be men and women that fear God and that live courageously. Now, one of those uh, people in Christian history 
who were courageous was a pastor by the name of Polycarp, okay? Everybody say Polycarp. If you're online, you try to mistype that all you want, okay? You can put it there on the chat, Polycarp. Polycarp was one of the first pastors in the history of the church, and he was a pastor in a city called Smyrna in the second century. He had been discipled by the apostle John himself. Can you imagine? That's pretty cool. It's like, yeah, I know he's my mentor, you know, my spiritual father. Just, you know, John, the beloved one, disciple. Yeah. Uh, so he was discipled by him in, in around the year 155. The Roman government seized Polycarp. And they, they dragged him into one of those stadiums, sort of like the Colosseum where they would put Christians to shame and they would uh, torture them or kill them. And as he faced imminent death and martyrdom, he uttered the following words that I'm going to read to you in just a moment, which thankfully have been preserved throughout history so that it could bless you and me today as we seek to live with courage. Listen to the exchange. Thereupon he was led forth, and great was the uproar of them that heard that Polycarp had been seized. Accordingly, he was led before the proconsul, this was like the governor of that city, who asked him if he were the man himself. And when he confessed, the proconsul tried to persuade him by saying, have respect for your age, and so forth, according to their customs. Swear by the genius of Caesar, the proconsul says, repent, say, away with the atheists. <laughs> because Christians, you know, they were called atheists back then. Because they refused to worship uh, idols. Then Polycarp, he looked with a severe countenance in the mob of lawless heathen in the stadium. And he waved his hand at them. And looking up to heaven, he groaned and said, away with the atheists. But the proconsul urged him and said, swear and I will release you. Curse the Christ. And Polycarp responded, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he hath done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? But the proconsul, again, he persisted. And he said, Swear by the genius of Caesar. And Polycarp answered him, if, and Polycarp said, if you vainly imagine that I would swear by the genius of Caesar, as you say, pretending not to know what I am, hear plainly, I am a Christian. And in that moment, Polycarp was murdered for the Christian faith. And sometimes because of martyrs like Polycarp, instead of Christianity being shut down, it actually expanded. See, Polycarp knew that Christianity comes at a cost. It is costly, but nowhere close to the cost that Jesus Christ paid on the cross for you and for me. When he forgave us of our sin, when he gave us a purpose, and when he gave us an inheritance to be a part of a kingdom that knows no end. So how do we live, listen, in the midst of a fragmented world? We model a distinct collective witness we retaliate with blessing and we fear God and live courageously because we have the king above 
everything in heaven ruling and reigning on your behalf and mine. Would you pray with me? God, I want to pray for all of those who are here and those watching online right now. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would show us the different ways in which we have not met your standard today. God, I pray, Lord, that if there have been different parts of our life, God, where we have not been modeling uh, this distinct witness, this Christian witness, Lord, I pray you convict us right now that if we have fostered pride or a lack of Yeah, just humility, Lord, or anger and a lack of sympathy and brotherly love and understanding. Lord, I pray in this moment, God, that we would repent and turn to you. And that you would help us, Lord, to be people who are wise and loving in our speech. Help us to be an example, Lord. Thank you, God, that we don't have to do this in our own power, God. I pray that you would please help us to submit to your spirit that we may be able to be a people who bless instead of curse. God, I pray for those who may be at home or here who are struggling with fear, Lord, in the midst of this time, who are making decisions in life, Lord. I pray, God, that in this moment, in this time, Lord, right now, that you would break that fear that you would help us to live courageously, Lord. God, thank you that we don't have to walk alone. Father, I pray you would begin to fuel each and every person that is listening to this word right now with that spirit of truth that comes from you, Father. I pray you would break any kind of chains that are holding people back in this place or online, God. We know right now this is a season where we need you. We are in the midst of this pandemic. Help us to be wise. Help us to be loving. And help us to remember the great price that you paid on the cross. Not so that we can feel guilty, but rather so that we can feel liberated to be able to move forward and walk forward in love. Please, God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.